Hello everybody. Hoi zusammen, as we say in Zurich. Hoi zusammen just means hello everybody. So now you know Swiss German. My name is Marco Marco Kovic. I'm the president of the Swiss Skeptics, one of the organizations, as you can see, that organized this event. Jan Niklas is also with us. He is with the Hochschulgruppe Revolutionary Humanist Zurich, a student group here at the university, and he co-organized this event. Thank you very much. We are very honored to have four guests, four skeptical superstars here with us tonight. I don't like talking about people, I like people to talk about themselves. So let's pass the baton, maybe to the lady, if that's okay for the gentleman. That's fine. And you can just introduce yourselves. Do you want me to do my five minutes right now, or do you want me to just say who I am? Maybe look, let's do a quick round of who you are. My name is Susan Gerber. It's not on. It's not on. Oh, I get to say my name twice. Let's see. I hope Hello? It's on? Yeah. My name is Susan Gerbeck. My name is Mark Edward. Hey guys, my name is Lou. <laughs> How did you say it? Good evening, everyone. Hoi Tama. Hoi My name is Andras Pintia. So back to Susan? Yeah, maybe back to Susan. So you know their names right now, and the names sound very international, so that's quite interesting. And now we have, we're going to have a small introduction, everybody's going to say what they do, what their area of expertise is, and we'll see that this is quite an exquisite group of skeptics. Well, I'm an Olympic no. <laughs> skier. No. Um, my name is Susan Gerbeck. I am, I am in, I live in California. But I run an international Wikipedia editing team. I call myself a science activist because my Wikipedia editing team exists in many languages. We are motivating, training, finding people to change the tenth largest Wiki the tenth largest website in the world, which is Wikipedia. It's too important for people to well, people get all their information from the internet. They Google things, they're starting to question things. Oh, I thought you wanted my five minutes. No, this is just the intro, right? I don't think the five minutes is okay. Yeah. No, yeah. I'm still so good. <laughs> so we're trying to change Wikipedia pages. We are only focused on scientific skepticism, science, and pseudoscience. We're trying to change all the Wikipedia pages we possibly can in all languages possible to reflect really good information so that the Wikipedia page has great citations and has great information because we know that people are ac accessing those pages. It is the 10th largest website in the world and it's really important that those pages exist in great shape. When somebody's starting to question or try trying to change their mind or they're learning about a brand new uh, topic, let's say some sort of new age kind of uh, product that's out on the market, or a documentary, or a new person who, a psychic or a healer, is coming to the media's attention and they start getting a lot of media hype, people are going to learn about them by Googling them, and Google or whatever web search they use, and they're gonna most likely find a Wikipedia page first. So we feel that it's extremely important that that Wikipedia page, the information they find, is well written, with great citations, with good information. And if it needs to have criticism on it, then it needs notable criticism on there. If it is a person who's one of our people, a person who's a scientist or a activist or a author or somebody who's doing great science, those people's pages are usually not in very good shape. And so what my team does is it tries to improve those people's pages so that the media will take, take action and will see those pages and feel like this is a good person to approach. This is a great person to be able to um, be in the face of whatever uh, science we want to represent on TV. So I train, I recruit, I mentor people from all over the world. I have just added, I think, my 102nd editor. We exist completely on Facebook in a secret cabal 
a secret group where we discuss and we train and we encourage and motivate each other. And I'm looking to recruit because we have very, very few um, in comparison uh, uh, people who speak languages other than English working for us. I mean, we have probably a third of my 100 people speak languages other than English. And we really do need more editors we can train to edit pages that are non-English speaking pages. That's me. That's it? Cool. Okay, so I'm Mark Edward. I'm a mentalist, and my background is in uh, magic and deception. And I have studied magic since I was a small child. And through the study of magic, I went through a lot of changes where I finally kind of ended up uh, learning about psychics and so-called mediums and studying their methods. And for me, their methods are fascinating, and I love the artifice of what they do. But what I do not like is the outcome of what they do, because it's a lie, okay? So my contention is that we are in, I call it the golden age of the con right now. So if you think spiritualism back at the turn of the century was bad, we are really in bad shape right now with all the pseudoscience and the beliefs that are out there. And so my job is to uh, publicly educate people as best I can and pass on the idea that cold reading, how many people know what cold reading is in this group? Only a, well, about half. Cold reading is the ability to look at a person that you have no, you've never met them, you have no idea about them, and convince them within two or three minutes that you somehow know everything about them. And it, it, a good cold reader can be very strong and very powerful in the minds of the lay audience, but to a magician or somebody who is trained in deception, especially verbally deception, verbal deception, uh, it's very transparent and laughable, really. So my contention right now with this tour is that cold reading and its techniques is no longer just the purview of the mentalist or the magician or the psychic that you see on television. It is now a survival skill. And that lying has become an accepted business practice. Uh, you know who our, our president is in the United States, unfortunately. So you know that he is one of the biggest con artists to ever come from anywhere, out of no, pretty much out of nowhere, to become president of the United States. And his methods are not that much different from what a psychic or a medium who says they're going to talk to your dead grandmother. It's uh, kind of make it up as you go along. You know, you start off with a basic lie, and then you course correct by watching how the sitter or the subject responds. So my idea is that cold reading and hot reading, which is where you have information beforehand that the people in the audience do not know that you have, and you skillfully weave it into a, oh, I see a picture of, and it can be very convincing. These are performance artists, okay? They are not gifted spiritual advisors, you know, because otherwise, why would they need to sell a ticket to their show, right? I mean, if you could really talk to a dead person you would be the most dangerous person on the planet. And I'm hope that, hoping that people who are out there listening to this understand and just say to yourself, what is more likely that this person who I bought a $300 ticket from to sit in their audience is connected to a dead person who he, can commun he or she can communicate with, or that they are just a very cl a clever manipulator of uh, facts. So another one of my contentions is that this world has now begun to dovetail with politics, and that's why we're in the mess we're in. Thank you. Hey guys. Uh, okay, so what I do is a bit is a bit different. Uh, I'm not specifically into specifically skepticism or activism or <laughs> exposing psychics, etc. Uh, I do popular science events. So what, what my kind of job is to popularize uh, contemporary work of scientists. So anything from biology to physics to neuroscience, etc. What we do is we do events. We do monthly events, one to three events, which are basically type of skeptics in the pub things. So we go to bars, we go to clubs, and we try to 
make it as a pastime. We try to uh, make people interested in science as, as a way of spending their free time instead of like going to a cinema or going to like a cultural exhibition such as like have a beer, see a few people and be into science. Uh, we do also bigger events which are um, about 700 people roughly two times a year. Our goal there is to have the whole community, the whole bulk of, uh, of our audience to enjoy popular science from a bunch of speakers from across the world. So, we've been doing this for about six years now. Um, our main goal with this is to try and try and have science as a focus in the public sphere. So, it is, it is my idea that, and it's my belief to a degree, uh, that science in the public sphere can only help for a decent social structure. What, what I mean by this is, People are more likely to be uh, more aware of their surroundings, more aware of their political or etc. beliefs, if they have the context of uh, contemporary science. I have just a really quick video just to give you an example of uh, what I mean. Can I switch it on? I can. I think we can do it like this. It's like literally one minute, so you get an idea of what's happening. Uh, so this is Andy sure. Berry. And I'm using these guys. Um, to indicate as my, uh, as my indicator or my symbol of this sameness, genetic sameness, coupled with remarkable difference. Okay? These guys evolved from wolves about 12,000 year, years ago. So humans domesticated wolves and then they started breeding and suddenly wanted a really big and stupid dog and suddenly wanted a really small and stupid dog. Okay? And they worked hard to achieve that. Um, just to remind you, here's, this is an old scheme of dog evolution. This has all happened. I mean, think of all the dogs you see on the streets of Sofia. Stupid little sausage dogs, huge monster dogs, aggressive bastard dogs, pathetic fluffy little dogs. This has all happened in 12,000 years. So, you see what the idea is. You have somebody be engaging, be interesting to a public audience. Like, not a specialized type of thing. And uh, that, makes, that makes science sexy, and that's my job. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as mentioned before, I'm Andras Pintier. I uh, represent several different project, uh, projects and organizations as well. I'm, uh, uh, first of all, uh, uh, Vice President of the Hungarian Skeptic Society. Uh, uh, a couple of days ago, I was elected on the uh, board as an associate board member of the European Council of Skeptic Organizations. But I know Susan from uh, the time when I actually joined Guerrilla Skepticism on Wikipedia, a very interesting and very important uh, international project. So it's that international that even a small, teeny tiny country like Hungary actually, actually learned about it and uh, we decided to join in. So just wink wink. Um, and, um, but probably most importantly, um, I, with uh, two co-hosts, I'm hosting and producing a podcast, that uh, a weekly podcast called the European Skeptics Podcast. We like to call it the ESP. Um, for those of you uh, scientifically or psychologically trained, um, the ESP means uh, extrasensory perception. Obviously, we're not promoting that. Um, we are trying to. We just are trying to pull a, um, a, um, a pun on that. However, uh, what we try to provide is um, is a hub for different organizations and different skeptical projects, um, mainly in Europe but also in the world. And uh, why we feel that it's very important is because um, when you think about, I don't know how many, how many of you are podcast listeners in general? How many of you listen to any kind of podcast? Okay, so you know what a podcast is. Uh, when you listen to skeptical podcasts, uh, and you, you look at the, the, the market of skeptical podcasting, you will hear American podcasts, UK podcasts, uh, Australian podcasts, 
But even though there are, as far as I know, you have a podcast. Katika Schweiz has a podcast as well. But to, it's, it's because of the, the language. Uh, there is a language barrier that prevents it uh, from being known all across Europe. So from the outsider, uh, it looks as if the European skeptic movement was not doing anything. And then there was, there was nothing happening here, only because in English there was no content. Or there is a lot, because I, we usually uh, read Marco's uh, uh, articles, which are very good. Sometimes when, when they are relevant, we feel they are relevant to a wider European audience. We even mentioned on the, on the show. And we have uh, inter even um, interviewed Marco. So, wh whenever we feel like there is something out there happening in Germany, happening in Italy, happening in Switzerland, happening, happening in Poland, that the others should know about, that would help their work towards trying to get rid of uh, pseudoscience or fighting pseudoscience and educating people <coughs> into how to cope with today's world of, uh, of a flood of pseudoscience. Uh, out there and just outright, li ra outright lies, uh, we are trying, them, trying to help them find the proper means uh, for their work. And this is what the European Skeptics Podcast does from week to week. Oh, you've got, you've got a mic. Okay. <laughs> Thank you guys very much. So the idea is that I have a couple of questions prepared for you guys, so we get the discussion started and it's going to like organically evolve and all of you can ask questions and participate. So it's really a discussion, not a lecture. One thing I'd like to know, and I'm always interested in that, with people who care about science, who care about critical thinking, we are all cerebral people, a lot of rationality thinking, but the heart is in it as well. So why do you guys care about the things you care about? Go for it. I care about science. I have no idea how it started, but I've always cared about science. I've always been uh, very curious about the world around me. And science is the best method out there to actually know what's happening out there. Uh, so if you, if you want to be sure that you're not just imagining something, if you're not just making stuff up, there is science for you <coughs> to make sure that, that, that you are the closest to reality. And uh, when you recognize that, and when you start learning about that, that's when you start becoming enthusiastic about it. I mean, uh, you can be enthusiastic about science without knowing what science is all about. But once you start knowing it, uh, it gets even more exciting. And uh, when you and why I am so uh, enthusiastic about the <coughs> skeptical uh, activism that I'm I'm trying to do is because I do think that I kind of in the last almost twenty years that I've been a skeptic, um, I've learned a lot about the human psyche. Uh, how how the human mind works, uh, how how we deceive ourselves, and how we um, uh, make ourselves believe things that are not actually real, and um, and not only that, but I can see how other people can exploit that, and I want to make sure, and I want to do something about what's happening in the world, uh, what Mark uh, said earlier that we are living in a world of deceit. We are uh, where where we are constantly bombarded with with uh, um, things that are actually not uh, not far from uh, just <coughs> everyday con, and that cold reading techniques, knowing what they are and how to how to do them and what people are doing to us is a survival skill now, and also is uh, how science works and how to spot when something is parading as science, but is not real science. Okay, what was the question? <laughs> Why do you love science? Why do you, Why do you care about okay. science? So, okay, so the thing is, I'm into this because it's interesting to me. I'm really interested in physics. I used to, 
I used to do some random horrible studying about languages, stuff like Latin, ancient Greek, etc. But I was always really, really interested in physics. So I started studying physics at one point. But that's not something you can do professionally once you're 25 and working in a, in a business thing, basically. So I started what I'm doing right now as a hobby. Um, I'm, I'm doing what I'm doing because it's really fucking interesting. It, I get to meet really cool people, these guys excluded, obviously, but some really <laughs> good people, like that guy over there, he's awesome. Um, so yeah, uh, the reason this is, I'm doing it from a personal point of view, is entirely egoistical. It's, it's nothing to do with a course, it's nothing to do with feeling great about myself or willing to change society, whatever. It's entirely because I like it and I want to do it. Well, talking about from the heart, how I, why it's from my heart is because several years ago I wrote a book called Psychic Blues. It's right up here and there's my uh, website. Psychic Blues, as a magician and a mentalist, uh, I saw that people were using techniques that were stolen from men the great mentalists in history, the great mind readers. and. They were calling it psychic awareness, and uh, I saw what it did to people because in order to write my book, Psychic Blues, I decided I am going to infiltrate this world, this market, the psychic market, and I am going to scam the scammers by using my stage skills, which most psychics do not possess, and my, my uh, ability to perform as a performer, and convince the people in the market who run this huge billion dollar market that I was the best in the world that they were going to find. And I actually got a letter from uh, the Psychic Friends Network, you may remember that, it was a 900 line. After working for them for about two years I got a letter saying, we're looking for the world's best psychic. And I said, here I am. <laughs> so it was a thing that's like, as if, act as if you are, and you can get somewhere, you can infiltrate. So what I did for about eight, eight years, probably longer than I should have, I played the role. So why has it hurt my heart? Because I've seen personally the harm that it can do to people. I have seen people, I used to call them psychic junkies. People who would not even take a bath in the morning before they called me and made sure it was okay. So, I mean, there's a, there's a, there are degrees to this belief system, but when you are, when you've lost a child or your child has been uh, murdered and you want relief, you should not be going to a psychic or medium because they are not going to let you go until they drain the last penny out of your bank. And I've seen it hurt. And I've been there, and I've seen people break down in tears in my shows. And of course, at the end, I say, I just made all this up. So some people don't like that because it's, they feel manipulated. But that's the whole point. Well, I don't have a science degree. I don't have, was, didn't have the love of science that uh, maybe the others do. Um, I'm 55. When I was raised in California, you know, girls didn't do science, girls didn't do math, so I was kind of shuttled off into doing more um, home ec kind of things and, and so on. So I didn't get to have the love of science. I wish I had had the chance to do that. But now I do work supporting science. And I think my angle is more that I love people. I really like to, so, so, I love people, I love to understand why they work the way they do, I like to understand that we're trying to help them. I think of myself more as a consumer advocate, and that's how I think of skepticism, organized skepticism, scientific skepticism, is that we're trying to help people get the best value for their, for their money or their, um, their time. <laughs> well, yeah, so you know, if you're going to go see a psychic, you should make sure the psychic is working. You shouldn't just go to a psychic and just you sh there should be some way of validating that. You know, there should be some kind of claim. I was also raised very gullibly. I didn't have, uh, back in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, we didn't have the internet. If you wanted to know something, you had to go to the library, or you asked a friend. And so one of the things that scared me the most when I was growing up was spontaneous human combustion. 
So I don't know if you guys remember that, but when I was growing up, and if you heard of spontaneous human combustion, that's the, you're just walking down the street, and all of a sudden you burst into flames. And then you die. And they're inside. So even if you jump on the ground and you roll around, you can't put the flames out. So how was I supposed to know that that was anything different? How did I know? If, you, if I asked my friends, they would say, yeah, so the little, so spontaneous human combustion really happens because that little girl over there, she, see, that's the last of her shoe. She's dead. You know, nobody's going to tell you the truth. And if you went to the library to find out some information, we're well, going to get a book on some paranormal belief in it. So I feel that it's extremely important for the people, for, for society, that we can get some kind of information so that they can Google something like that and they have the, act, the actual evidence. Because I, I don't want people to be hurt. I really feel like we need to have, I don't want people scared. I don't want another little girl scared about spontaneous human combustion. I want her to be, I want her to be all right. I don't know who she is, but we got her back. Oh, okay. works well. yeah, yeah. So you don't do exactly the same things, but you do have some specific goals that you want to achieve. Mm -hmm. How well are you doing? How well are you achieving those goals? How effective are you? How much impact do you have? I don't think we're having any impact at all. And that's why it's called It's About Time. Because I personally am tired of the lies, I'm tired of the bullshit, I'm tired of the deception, I am sick of it. In fact, at one point we were going to call our tour, take out the garbage tour. <laughs> because it's like you open the refrigerator and you know it really is smelling pretty bad, take the garbage out. And so, but unfortunately, from my perspective, I don't think we're doing well at all. But that doesn't mean that I don't have hope because... They're, you're here, and you're, whoever's watching this is watching it. And that's all it takes is to, to spread this idea that, you know, it only takes one little act of uh, sort of a heroic skepticism to plant the seed in people's minds. And once you, uh, we were just with Randy, and James Randy, the amazing Randy, and he has this incredible skull walking cane, and engraved on it, it says, Doubt leads to truth. So, I just want to inject a little doubt. You know, if you see something in this hand, you need to start thinking about what the other hand's doing. Okay, so for me, that's kind of a, kind of a different question. Uh, because we do a lot of stuff, but we, it, it, it's not as if we have one go. Say, we've reached... 10% of our population in terms of uh, people that have come to our events, etc. I think it's a work in progress thing. Uh, what we've managed to do right now is have pretty big events for our country. I'm from Bulgaria, so, yeah. so we do pretty okay in terms of uh, reaching our audience, but at the end of the day, we don't reach a huge mass of people. I'm still trying to figure out how to do that. I really don't know yet. I mean, I'm trying a bunch of different stuff. I'm trying to make uh, different formats uh, in terms of events, do more media um, attendance, be more in the newspapers, more in blogs, more in blogs, do podcasts, etc. Oh, any reasonable way that somebody can um, see more of our content and try to do that. I don't know if, if, it's, if that's the thing, I, I can say if we do this we'll be finally successful. I don't, I don't think that it works like this, it's just an effort. We try to do as much as possible and be as effective as possible with the amount of time that I have and the specialty that I have. But I'm not sure. It's, it, it's an endeavor. Yeah, and I, I think um, the fact that your work is not kind of confrontational in the way that you are not trying to fight against something, um, but you are trying to spread the word of science and, and, and give them people that is... Uh, give them, give the people uh, who attend something that is worth taking home. Uh, that's that's um, a bit of a difference. But we are we skeptics in general are a bit more confrontational, and that results in um, rejection uh, uh, occasionally. And uh, but there are small moments when there is actually something that you can tell yourself that you have achieved. Um, 
well, we can uh, we can take courage and uh, and some encouragement out of those moments and keep doing what we do. But uh, I th I'm, I'm really hoping that when Susan gets to answer that question, uh, she will give she will throw a couple of numbers at you. Okay, so skeptics like numbers, right? Uh, a couple years ago, somebody said, I have to be able to measure how much impact my project is having on, and here's, and I have stickers for everybody. So if you didn't show up and you're watching this live, you don't get a sticker. So I have stickers, don't let me forget. Slackers. Slackers, no. <laughs> she in Switzerland. So um, the Girl Skeptics Project, what I do is I keep track of every time we make a sizable edit change. And I mean, create a new Wikipedia page in full, not like a little stub. Or I keep track of how many pages we've rewritten. And when I say rewritten, I mean sizable changes. Now, does everybody here use Wikipedia? Yeah, who hasn't used Wikipedia? Okay. So, what, the only way I can measure views is there's a, there's a tool that exists on Wikipedia that allows me to look at how many times a Wikipedia page has been accessed. It doesn't tell me if it's the same person clicking on it over and over. It doesn't tell me if they were on it for just a couple seconds. All I have is the limitations are that I can tell that somebody has accessed the Wikipedia page. So my project has written or rewritten large quantities of pages that are, we've written a little over 460 pages in many languages. None of them in Swiss, by the way. Just, just, just saying. Uh, we have a few pages in German, not very many. I had a Finnish editor uh, join me today and she's going to start training. But we keep track of just those 460 odd pages that we've created. And in the last, <clears throat> this morning when I looked right before we left our hotel, we've already had 14,267,000 page views from those 460 pages that we've created. And we're not counting just the normal edits we make, which we make tons of edits all the time that are just, you know, corrections or adding little bits of this or removing vandalism. But I'm only talking about the pages that we've really, really created. And Spontaneous Human Combustion, by the way, is one of the pages we rewrote. And that is one of the most viewed Wikipedia pages that we've ever created. Since the time we created it in 2013, it's already had over one million views. Can you believe it? I mean, when was the last time you guys thought about spontaneous human combustion? And here we are talking about it, and over a million times that page has been viewed. So that's how I keep track of how uh, we, we, we're trying to have a number of, uh, you know, how well we're doing, what we're doing. Can I, can I add something more? Sure. Um, since um, I, I just remembered that I can, I can throw a couple of numbers at you as well. I can throw uh, numbers right now. <laughs> Let's just throw numbers. So, um, yeah, I called for it and then uh, I forgot to <laughs> forgot to share it with you. Um, yeah, so one of the things uh, that we all use is Facebook and our Facebook pages do have that feature that we can actually track the traffic. We can we can see what's happening, and uh, I can tell you with the with the Hungarian Skeptic Society, um, there was a period that we we really reached uh, a lot of people and especially the growth rate of the, the, the page was pretty good. And I think you can all guess what it was uh, that, that generated all that traffic. We sh started making and sharing internet memes. So it w they were all uh, science and skepticism related, but it generated a whole lot of traffic. And, but that helped us reaching our audience when we, we wanted to share some very serious stuff with them. Because even though there were um, memes that could reach easily 50,000 people or more, uh, when, when you have that much of reach and, and Facebook registers your, your traffic, your everyday tra traffic, uh, it will reach a lot of people when, when you start um, promoting an event, you start promoting um, something that is um, that is of interest to everyone, but uh, with the with the podcast, 
we are about to reach our 100,000th download, which sounds like a lot, but it actually isn't. It isn't that much, because uh, when we start looking at the different countries where our traffic is from, or where the, the, the downloads are, are, are happening, well, us being a European Skeptics podcast, we have our largest listener base in the United States of America. <laughs> the next is uh, the UK. That's fine, they're still in the EU. <laughs> and uh, and uh, Australia, Canada, and Sweden. So these are the countries where people are listening to our show the most. But we would love to reach a wider audience. Uh, we would love to, because the, the content that we are sharing concerns everyone. So that's why, why we are sharing it. That we, we do believe very strongly that those things that we, are, we, we talk about are of interest to all skeptics out there because they can use it as kind of ammunition. You can use it as encouragement. You can use it as, as, as some kind of, uh, of, um, of an example of how to deal with stuff. So I do encourage everyone uh, being here or listening online to check out the European Skeptics Podcast and, uh, and find out if it's for them. And if you like them, please do share them, because that is the greatest help you can give to uh, content providers out there. Now, this is an interesting contrast of sorts. We have a podcast, we have memes being proactive, creating content, and we have guerrilla skepticism, which is like a martial term, it's clandestine, it's, it's strategic in the background. Which one of those approaches is better, and in what sense better? You guys should be able to answer that. I don't think there is any better. I, I think it all works, it's integral. Uh, I think we need more uh, approaches, we need more strategies, you know? The backs of cereal boxes, for crying out loud. I mean, that's a, that's a dream that will probably never come true. Stick but that way. Yeah, a stay, I, I don't care. It, does, it doesn't really matter because we're all, we all want the same thing. And, and uh, even, even the, the most conservative person in the United States, when you peel away all their anger and everything, they just, they want, they want, they're skeptical. That's why we ended up where we are, is because they're sick of the bullshit. So I work as, I do a lot of activism outside of just the Wikipedia project. I do a lot of things with Mark Edward. We do uh, some psychic stings. I also write for Scientific, um, Skeptical Inquirer magazine. I'm also a big promoter of conferences. I do a lot of other things as well as the Wikipedia project. But I think that the Gorilla Skepticism on Wikipedia project, my project, exists to support science. So we're kind of behind the scenes of everything that's happening. We are reporting on things, we're writing things, we're, we're making things happen from behind the scenes. Uh, to join my Wikipedia project, you have to be on Facebook because we will put you in our secret group. It's called the Secret Cabal. And it is a secret cabal. Well, it's called that because, why? Because it is a secret cabal. Well, because, because uh, Susan has been so effective in what she's done uh, that the believers in the paranormal uh, have accused her of having a secret cabal that works that works as a subversive element of Wikipedia. There is no subversive element oh, in yes, Wikipedia. There is. Yeah, but the, the <laughs> point is that like it's the truth. You can only cite true facts, and they have to be backed up. So people like Rupert and uh, does everyone know what this, a cabal is? A cabal. A cabal is a secret underground, you know, subversive agent. So what happened with Susan is she was accused of, by people like Rupert Sheldrake and uh, Deepak Chopra, she was accused of changing people's Wikipedia pages. And the funny thing was, a couple of them she didn't have anything to do with. And then they started saying, we need our own Susan Gerbic, which means it's working. And now there's actual talk that there's going to be an alternate Wikipedia. And we're like, yes, bring that on, you know. 
bring on the Wooopedia because <laughs> it will be hilarious and we will we will tear it to tiny little shreds because it won't be about truth. It'll be about the craziest misinformation they can think of. Anybody? Okay, another question or I don't think uh, they they have they cannot live alongside one another is I, I, I totally agree with everything uh, said uh, before me they have to work together we support each other's work and uh, everyone uh, adds their own skills their own efforts their, their their own achievements to the great picture I do I'm interested in your opinion because you're a little bit the odd one out in this group so you're not combative as you he likes said, well, he's very <laughs> But in the things you do, it's more like traditional science communication. Yeah. It's not against that's, something that's what you mean by tradition, yeah, I guess. Well, oh, I'm also the only one now because I don't care. Care. And I, <laughs> I didn't care for a while. I'm, I'm on my way there. Uh, <laughs> this is the way. Well, look, guys, I mean, that, what I do is an activism. I mean, it, you, you can't say it is in a way, but it, it is. really isn't. Uh, no. It is. Oh, we won't be, we won't be, we, we won't be aggressively pushing uh, science communication down someone's throat. We won't be saying that guy's an asshole. He's setting people on fire or some shit. I don't know. <laughs> what we do is we we try to go the soft approach. We try not to be assholes, and we try. Although I am one. Uh, that's that's the thing. You know? uh, we we try to make that stuff interesting. I think that's the only actual, reasonable, sustainable way to not divide people. Whenever you go in a room and say, homeopathy is bullshit, and you're bullshit, and you're like, oh, lost half of my audience. Mm -hmm. When you go and say, oh, you know what, you're, you're fucking retarded if you, believe, if you believe in spontaneous human combustion. Yeah, like, yeah, I can see that, but that those guys over there were like, oh, I was thinking about that like 10 years ago. I'm not sure I'm fucking retarded. That's divisive, and I, I dislike divisive stuff. I like inclusive stuff. I like people to be hyped about things, and whatever else they think about the world, be it like um, uh, mediums or whatever, it has to derive from their other interests. I, I don't think attacking directly their beliefs, especially Irrational beliefs is reasonable most of the time. Yeah, I just, can I just say? Yeah, you might say what I'm going to say. Well, I'll let you no, go. I, no, I have. I lost my thought. Okay, so <laughs> whatever he says, what he's saying is we don't, well, what, if I put, take this hat off about the Wikipedia and put on my psychic grief vampire hat, what we're trying to do when we, Mark and I, do things, stings or attacks against psychics, is we're not trying to get to the believer. Mm -hmm. That You cannot change the believer's mind. They already believe. You, okay, you can, but it's not easy. Not easy. What we're trying to do, when we go to a psychic uh, show, when there's a psychic and, and we're trying to do some kind of activism against the psychic, we're trying to get to the psychic. Because the person on stage is a performer. They're performing as a psychic. And if you can rattle them, if you can make them off their game, laugh at them, laugh at them or whatever you're going to do, it shakes them up. Their performance oh, isn't so good. And so that is, we're not going after the believer. Yeah, and I think to go along with what all of us all agree on is that humor, that is the way to go. Uh, I, in my own act, I use humor instead of a disclaimer. I get in a lot of trouble because people are like, you don't do a disclaimer. A disclaimer is when a mentalist comes out and says, everything I do, anyone can do. I don't have any powers, blah, blah, blah. I don't like that. I would rather inject a little bit of humor and skepticism in so people are kind of like, wait a minute. They don't, they're off kilter because it's entertainment. I push them a little bit, their belief system, but it's clear by the end of my show that I don't really have those powers without saying it. So humor, I think, is really, really important. And, and, and all you have to do is look at the United States right now. That's where we get our news from. Stephen Colbert, uh, uh, John Oliver, uh, uh, what was his name, Stewart? Uh, he's not on, he's John Stewart. But this is what's happening is we in America we don't know what's real and what's fake anymore. So 
but observational humor, which is kind of what Jerry Seinfeld started, where you observe and you make comments, and you know, it can kill people. I mean, look at Robin Williams. He observed a little too much, but that's the barometer. You know who Robin Williams is. I mean, he was depressed because he saw too much. So anyway, I'm off on a tangent. Humor is important. Humor is, reaches out to everybody, and it's a really good middle ground because you know I don't want people to think that I'm putting them down. I just want to understand why they're doing what they're doing and share with me. And if you've got some power that you can't explain, I'm all for it. Let's change physics overnight. Let's change the world. Let's talk to a dead person and make the biggest thing in history happen, which is what it would be. Uh, first of all, I, I do, I'd like to express my agreement with uh, Hugo, which is a historical moment. Uh, <laughs> uh, that if you go around telling people they're, they're retarded for believing in something that is just wrong, you, you're getting at it the wrong way. So it's, it's, it's not how you want to achieve something. I agree with Mark as well that humor can be a good thing. Uh, and I have to add that stand-up comedians are absolutely free to mock people for their idiotic beliefs. But that's their job, that's their role. We cannot be that, because then we're going to put, put people off, and we don't want that. And if I can share a personal story of mine, I used to debate um, creationists at my university. They would, they would come every semester, to give a, a, a talk on why evolution is not true and evolution is bullshit. So at first, obviously, I went there, I got aggressive because it pissed me off. What, the, the things that the guy would say would actually absolutely make no sense when he started rambling on about these irreducible complexity bullshit. <coughs> I was outraged and I expressed my outrage. Obviously, I lost. Uh, the next time, I tried a bit of a, a, a more delicate approach, uh, but it still didn't work. And by trial and error, uh, for, for, for the fourth or fifth time, I actually managed to reach the point when, uh, by fine-tuning my, my approach and my rhetorics, to, to achieve something very important. And I still... Uh, I still list that as my greatest achievement in skepticism when <laughs> well it was just one but no uh, never mind there were a couple uh, of wins against me so what I did was I waited till the end I didn't start fuming in the middle of his speech uh, I waited till the end, but I went there prepared. I knew what he was, he was going to talk about, and I was prepared of everything that he covered, and I knew all his arguments. So I started to question them very calmly, uh, very openly, and then I asked the, the audience, how many of you does actually know what evolution is all about? Because if you give me five minutes, I'm more than happy to tell you. And to the guy's um, anger, uh, he, he got really angry and he left the room and, and, and he left, left his audience there. When they started asking me questions, I got, uh, they, they voted. The audience voted for me to be given five minutes to, to tell them what evolution was all about. It was not an easy task, evolution is much more complicated than that. But uh, yeah, we have an evolutionary biologist here. Uh, he actually knows what I'm, what I'm talking about. I don't. Um, and, uh, the, and, and this is, this is how we ended the day. That I was surrounded by at least 15 people constantly asking me questions about what I, I, I told them about. And the whole thing started out as someone bashing evolution and evolution losing big time. So. That is something I'm still very proud of, and and that this is how I learned through trial and error, the hard way, 
how it, this, this approach could still work, the confrontational approach, if you go about it the right way. Thank you. All of that sounds great and it is great, but all of that is tactics. And if you try to take a step back and look at the big picture, what does that picture look like? What is the strategy looking like? Is there a strategy? Are we, for example, organizing the way we should be organizing? Are we organizing as effectively as the quote-unquote opponents we have? Do we have lobby groups? Do we have businesses? Is there a strategy in the skeptical pro-scientific movement? I want to ramble on now. I'm just going to say no. I'm actually going to say a huge no. I think, I think this is the least organized uh, movement I've seen in my life. Um, I come from a more business-oriented background. I think, I think the skeptic movement has a way, way longer path to go. Or science communication in general, everywhere. I'm not saying just about Bulgaria, like literally the U.S. etc. Goal setting in a fractured community is shit. I mean, you need, you need specific specific leaders, you need goals that are set and agreed upon easily, you need uh, short-term goals that somebody takes responsibility about, etc. We're not quite there, hopefully we'll be getting there soon. I'm really working on getting there really soon. So, yeah. I hate to say it, but no, I don't. I've been involved with the skeptical movement since the uh, middle 70s. And I've never seen more splintered, more uh, dispassionate, more apathy, more anger. It's a huge mess. So, but you know what? It's always darker before the dawn. Okay, so I'm going to disagree. I think that the question, as uh, Marco said, was uh, comparing us to the paranormal community. And I think we are extremely successful compared to the paranormal community. We are meeting each other, That's we're such talking. a low bar, though. Well, it's a bar, and that was the question he asked, is how are we doing compared to the paranormal communities? And they do not speak to each other in a lot of ways. They're not organized. These people don't understand what um, evidence means. Uh, so even if we look at Wikipedia, they don't have a clue. They, they, they're off of Wikipedia. They're not editing these things. It's, it's been... Uh, it's, yeah. Not really. They're kind of gone. They can't. They have no traction. So, as far as organized skepticism, we had a hand at that with some of the organizations tried by building buildings, by putting out magazines, by doing so many things. They had a huge success before the internet. And a lot of organizations exist because of groups like uh, SciCon, CSI, uh, Center for Inquiry, some of the other European groups, the Australian skeptics and so on. But I think that we have seen maybe the end or they're going to have to evolve and change. But it's starting to see other groups, small groups, new leaders are starting to come together. And one of the things we're finding, and that's part of our tour, is that pulling people in from different groups, from different organizations, from different cultures, different languages, is, is how we're going to survive this. I think we, I see that we're just starting out on, on the road. Now the social media has really changed everything. And I don't think you guys realize it, but I, we, we, we got in a car in Poland a week ago, and I've been riding with these three guys <laughs> in a car. It's been really a lot of fun. But we had some, we've been having a lot of great conversations, and I think that that's what we need, is we need to have more conferences, more discussions, more face-to-face -face meetings with people. And I think that we're going to get there. I really do feel like we're going to be able to do this, but it's it's some time. All right. I, I need to add something. No. Yeah. That was perfect. No. Um, yeah. We we need to elaborate on that. No. Uh, what I believe you meant is the outreach. We have no outreach whatsoever compared to the other side. Okay. And that we need to work on that. We need to reach people who are interested in this stuff, uh, the, uh, all this stuff that we deal with, but don't approach it the right way, or we, we are quite convinced that they don't approach it the right way because they don't know uh, how to think critically or how to approach the, these topics critically. So we need to do that, that's one thing. That requires strategy, that requires planning, that requires a, probably a different approach. 
we have to discuss all that. And Susan is right in saying that, that we are very well organized in one way, in trying to become a community. But that's not enough. We need, we need to do the actual work. And our organizations, the different organizations in different countries, do that a lot. But we need to coordinate that on, on a much higher level. And I am actually, Lubo is going to start laughing soon, but I'm actually very optimistic about the future of uh, an umbrella organization called the European Council of Skeptical <laughs> Organizations. Uh, because uh, we now, with the, with the no, new board that was uh, elected uh, um, in Rotov uh, a couple of days ago, uh, there are people who seem to be very, very active in the online community, uh, very, very well organized, and uh, and they 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 seem to be much more ready to, to face the new challenges. I'm not saying that the that the the, the former uh, board was not doing anything, but uh, but they had a very different approach. We we would like to do a bit more closer collaboration with uh, within the organizations under this umbrella organization. So I'm optimistic about that. I'm really hoping that I don't um, end up being disappointed. Yeah. Yeah. We have another question or questions? <laughs> Maybe just one little thing to add to this. So if we run with the idea that we are not, and I'm saying we like a community, are not as organized as we should be, what is the problem? Do we not have the funding? Do we need money? Do we not have the right people? We mentioned under that there was a uh, change going on on the European level. Or do we not have maybe the right issues? Are we talking about things that maybe the population doesn't care that much about, or not as much as we care about it? What is the problem? Okay, the problem is, is that for many, many years, we were focused on, a lot of the groups, the organizations that started were focused on academics. The leaders of the groups were academics. They felt that they should publish. They felt that they should research. They felt that they should um, speak. Uh, well, the only people on the board should be people who had PhDs, the people who had all the information, all the knowledge. And what happened is social media changed everything. And now the people who should be in charge are the people who are good at organizing, using all the tools necessary, Facebook Live, Twitter, Instagram, podcasting, all those avenues that were not um, around in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s. They were publishing in magazines, print magazines. So everything's changed, and we need to, we need to change with it. So we do not have necessarily the right leadership, and I'm not even sure we need leadership as a, as a whole. I don't want to follow one single leader. I'd like to have small leaders in different areas that are organizing things and keeping things on track with clear goals and, and, and so on. But I think the people who should be running things are more charismatic, socialized, um, not necessarily an academic. And I think that we are, until we see these changes happening with ECSO grassroots. and grassroots, yeah, I think that we're still at the beginning. It's just starting. My project, GSOW, is changing and adapting as I'm training and learning more ways of training people better. I'm, I, I'm fairly organized. Things are happening. And we've got, like I said, 14 million page views and over 100 editors. We are training people in other languages. We're doing some amazing things in my project. And there are some other organizations that are doing things that are great too, but they're small grassroots. I think the traditional way we did things isn't going to work anymore. <laughs> so let's maybe open up the discussion. So you guys have a lot of thoughts, I'm sure. We would like to. I'm not that um, optimistic about how well we're doing. Um, you said, okay, the psychics, they're disorganized and might disappear as a, as a fringe group. Um, that may well be, but um, when we look back a few years, two-thirds of the Swiss population or the voting population decided to um, change our constitution to have complementary medicine um, 
specially mentioned as the only type of medicine that is actually mentioned in our constitution. That has led to um, much more funding because there's now a lot more of these therapies that are in for good in the, the health system. It, we, um, it has consequences on, on uh, education of doctors or by nurses and so on. Um, there I think we're still on field one. We're, we're not achieving much if we're honest. We, we might have um, achieved more debates. Uh, there was one organized or co-organized by the skeptics yesterday in the, um, the medical faculty in Zurich. Um, the audience that appeared, predominantly um, me medical students, they, they are on our side. Um, but the ones who were successful in the evening were the two promoters of pseudoscience who could show um, what they had achieved in le uh, legislation, in, in uh, getting funding for, for teaching, etc. So, um, at least in some disciplines, I think we, we still have to do loads, loads better. I'm also one of the organizers of, of one of these um, outreach events, the Denkfest, which is going to happen quite soon, um, and I guess we'll be um, reasonably pleased with um, the turnout, but if we're honest, um, we're not even on field one. Is that a question? <laughs> it's, no, um, well, okay, let's, um, Marco said, um, or mentioned one thing which is different between us and them, the money. We, we don't profit from what we're doing. Um, is that not maybe, maybe the most important difference? No, because uh, you know, my unfortunately in my experience, this is my experience. You can't. People won't won't pay for the truth. You have to just get out on the streets and speak it. And and I hear what you're saying, but I also think that even though these bills have been passed, once they're proven to be to be worthless, you know, it has to have, go through that cycle, and when they're proven worthless by science, which has to eventually take hold, it has to, because people will get sick or they'll die, or if they don't get vaccinated, their children will become sick. I mean, it's self-evident science-based medicine, and that's the way, that's what, that's what we have. So, we are just happen to be in a bad patch right now, where, and I, just real quick, I mean, I grew up in the 60s, and I love the 60s, and I'm stuck in the 60s. I still love the music. I love a lot of things that happened then. But I think that's what's to blame, is because when the 60s and 70s opened the floodgates to all the woo, and everybody felt free and free love and all this, now we're paying the price for it, because it's, it's, it's coming back to haunt us with all these crazy beliefs. But it's like a tide. It's got to come in and it's got to go out. And the only way it's going to go out is that if we persist. I, you know, I know, in America they have this thing now where they're saying resist. But I say it's not resist, it's insist. So it can happen. It's just don't let it get you down. It's going to take time. I have to agree that it is going to take time. It is really just hard eating. I know exactly what you mean. But let me give you one example. In California, we had uh, an outbreak of measles. I don't know if you remember, at Disneyland. Disneyland 2015. And the science is on our side. We know already about vaccinations and homeopathy and all these different kinds of things. We already know that science is already there. So what happened is some children got sick and there was an outbreak of measles and people said no. And within a few months, we Three met. Months few months we managed to get the, a referendum changed and now the exemption for people to use for not being vaccinated is changed completely and it, it was I think it's going to we're going to see lots more of these kinds of things happening where it's going to be something bad it's going to it's going to get bad before it gets it's what do you say it's going to get worse before it gets better but I think that once it gets better I think it's going to get a lot better really quickly so I see that these things will happen I, I really am confident that we're gonna we're gonna see a change because science is on our side, right? Can I say one more thing? I mean, in my my particular area, there have always been psychics, and there will always be psychics, and it's like whack a mole. You you knock one down, and three more come up. But the point is, eventually, we found out from protesting. 
There's a lot of people, you know, when we're in the psychic world, we're kind of, not psychic, the psychic. skeptic world, we become kind of insulated and we start to think negatively. And to give you an example, my example, when we did a protest for John, uh, Sylvia Brown, I don't know if you remember her, but Sylvia Brown was in the U.S. and she was in Las Vegas and on the same weekend as Randy's Tam was there. So we, in two hours, we got like, what, 25 people together and we went to the front of his her arena, and we had a big banner that said Sylvia Brown convicted felon, because she was, and what we found is, yeah, there were maybe, there were lots of people going into her show who were shaking their heads at us, but by and large, the people who were crossing in front of it just to get down the street, they were all going, yeah, she's so full of crap, oh, psychics are terrible. So we realized that, hey, there are an awful lot of people that are on our side, but they're just not involved because they just don't care or they, they take it for granted. They say, of course she's not real. So that's one thing to remember. You can become, you can become so, what's the word, insulated that you don't realize that things are happening. Okay, and then I have one more thing that I can't remember. <clears throat> I think your approach is, is a bit naive. Um, yes. Wait, whose approach? Both of yours. <laughs> okay. um, because it's not going to be enough to to do our stuff and uh, and be absolutely positive that it will it will eventually get there. It's it's going to happen. People will realize. Yeah. First of all, then it might be too late. Yeah. Uh, think about climate change. Think about GMOs. Uh, or think about vaccination. Vac Anti-vaccination is still on the rise, and even though people uh, and um, different countries in Europe, for example, we've talked about that on the show, just saying, uh, uh, are are doing something about it. So governments have decided to to uh, put out stricter regulations regarding vaccinations in these countries. But it's not it's it's not going to be enough when the anti-vaccination movement, movement is on the rise. And, uh, for example, homeopaths. If there is nothing, no effort uh, uh, being made to get rid of uh, homeopathy in the, the national healthcare system, then it's going to just st stay there forever because people will not realize if they die because of using homeopathy instead of something else, uh, that that it's it's basically homeopathy killing them. We have to make it clear for them that this is the case, and we have to make uh, legislators realize that is the case. And for that, we have to have the resources. We have to have. Uh, we won't have the same resources because, yes, telling the truth uh, about a controversial tr topic. It's not going to be pretty. It's not going to be sexy. It's not going to be something that will people uh, willingly pay for or pay a lot of money for. But the woo, when, what, whatever makes them feel good. Okay, these people spent an hour talking to me in, in their office, uh, selling me homeopathic remedies, <coughs> but in the, pre in the process, I was being taken seriously. This person was kind to me, and that doctor was not. This is a much more serious and much more complex issue than, than, than what we're trying to. So if, if we leave it to politicians and, <laughs> and people like that uh, to decide and, and to wait until it's, it's really time to act, then it's, it's going to be too late. Wait, wait. I have one quick thing. We can't say, think about it. If the anti-vax came in and got rid of vaccines, what would happen? We'd have tons of deaths and we'll a lot see. of things. Then we'll we would see. change like that. You will see what And happens. And the other thing I would add is I'm much older. I have seen amazing changes in the world in my lifetime that I thought would never, I could never have imagined. So I have a much more optimistic view, maybe Mark does too, because we've seen so much change. You've got to see the big picture. Things well, happen. The science is out there. Let's go. Question. Next question. <laughs> we'll, argue, we'll argue about this in the car tomorrow. So I promised that I thought of this question before the discussion reached this point, uh, but it's I think it's relevant. So uh, certainly about science communication, 
there was a recent study that, that showed that um, about changing people's minds about climate change. People who were skeptical about climate change, what, what, what would change their mind? And they, sh they studied this the perspective of giving people information about climate change. And they found that that actually made people more skeptical that climate change was happening. Uh, and then they had an alternate treatment that they applied to people, which was to appeal to their emotions, pictures of disasters and things like this. And this helped change people's mind about the reality of climate change much more effectively, even though from a scientific standpoint, it's complete nonsense. And the, the question is, should we, we uh, I don't know how we would define ourselves, but uh, as scientists or people who are interested in rational thinking, should we use these techniques that, that aren't actually part of our belief system to, you know, to, uh, to get people to behave the way that we think they should behave, or should we restrict ourselves to only educating people, only providing rational tools? And maybe you know, to go along with this, I would ask about, you know, when you have speakers who communicate science in an you know, effective, friendly way, right, is the goal to, to give people content or to give them tools to, to, that they can use later in their, in their life, lives to, to make better decisions. Do you see a, a trade-off between the two, and do you focus on, on one more than the other? Okay, so I'm going to take this and I'll give it right back to you, I promise. First thing is, the climate doesn't give a shit about what people believe. We have climate change, it's changing, and it doesn't matter what, if we're not going to take a vote, you know, people aren't going to get to vote on whether we're going to have climate change or not. So changing their minds isn't going to really make a big deal, and the government's going to have to, to initiate. And right now in America, in, in the Caribbean, Puerto Rico, and all that, we're seeing some pretty nasty climate change, and I think that we're going to start seeing some changes here really quickly. I know that Trump is... Oh God. When Trump's house gets destroyed. Yeah, when Mar-a-Lago gets destroyed. Well, no, my point is, it's going to happen really quickly. Um, the second thing I was going to say, what she said about... Um, Pick the, pictures rather than... No, about... Um, Oh gosh, it was perfect. I'll take it by you. Okay, later. but I, I want to. Back I think that, that that I always believe fight fire with fire, and if pictures work better than because a lot there's a lot of people who don't know how to read, and they distrust information that is is in print. So yeah, pictures. Yeah, I think there's no problem with that because it's more visceral. It's more you know like what was the latest picture we just saw that really upset people I'm trying to remember um, it was just a few months ago there was a picture of what was that it, it was something that just that really spread great. across the world in like two minutes and it just it had such a huge effect on people so I th and we are a visual culture we're used to seeing car chases and explosions and all that so I say anything, anything that gets people to open their eyes is worth it, you know? And even if it, even if you, uh, oh, I don't want to say lie, <laughs> but listen, I, my, as a magician, my job is to be a liar. My father was in advertising, and Mark Twain, I think it was the person who said, advertising is legalized lying. And I know from watching my father, he was like one of these guys that's on that TV show, What Is It, Mad Men? that he would take a subject and take it all the way to the very edge of where it was just about to fall over the precipice of being a lie, and then he would stop. So I think that that's the way the culture is, so you have to do that. You have to hit it between the eyes because people are like, I don't want to read that scientific garbage. They don't trust science, but they trust their own eyes. Your turn. Okay. minute. <laughs> yeah, okay, so let's get back to your question specifically. So what you're saying is, should you, should, should for example, speakers at the conference uh, try to appeal to emotion in some shape or form, and should that all be providing tools or rather something else? Well, I think, I mean, at least from my point of view, I think the best way you can do is do what all sorts of, uh, all sorts of entertainment does. It tries to do a group thing. It says, tries to do an in-group, out-group type of thing. It tries to make good events because people like going to interesting shit. It 
they like going to places that where they can communicate with people who are under some shape or form thinking in the same way as they do. We try to make it with the least part of resistance type of thing, so that there isn't something they would object, they would, that would divide them, that would turn them away. So in a way it's cheating, yeah. You're not getting them specifically with cold-hearted reason. You're not got, getting them with that specific, such a good fucking argument that I'm immediately convinced. People don't fucking work like that. People work in the sense of, oh, I like that. I, I, I like that place. I like those people. I like that, the vision of the whole thing. I like that it looks fancy. Uh, I like it that it looks contemporary, it looks new. I like all the all those irrational type of things. And I structure my events in that sense that it, they have to be all those things, and I just try to push the content to be actually true content in it. But it has to be all those things first, so as to get the people, and the rest follows. Again, I do not agree that you have to be doing something else. I, I disagree that you have to rely on people thinking for themselves and that kind of thing. Yeah, that's good. Think for yourself. If that, if that helps you at night, good. But from my point of view, you just have to convince people the software. First of all, we are, even though we like to think of ourselves as uh, rational beings, we are not really. It, it, makes a, it, it takes a lot of effort and, and practice to become rational. Uh, but so the most important things are, are emotions for ourselves. And there, there's a wide range of uh, emotions that we can experience. When I attend, I haven't yet, but I tend to at some point, it's going to be attend uh, one of uh, Lubo's events, when there are enthusiastic scientists talking, talking about their own stuff, that enthusiasm is contagious. That is something that comes across, helps, helps science come across and reach me. Uh, uh, if, if you can talk about the, the best kind of science, the most exciting stuff, if you don't do it with that, that, that emotion in the background, you just lost your audience. It's, it's, it's impossible to reach them. The other thing, you have to scare people to make them act on something. And uh, you have to, there, there can be infographics, that can be emotionally uh, driven and emotionally uh, elevated uh, kind of uh, pictures that, that will make people feel bad about something. Think about all the war movies that we have seen in the last uh, decade, since the Second World War. They make us realize, they make us, they make us feel the pain and reject war. But think about anti the anti-vaccination. We have no idea, our generation has no idea what a polio was like. What a child with polio had to go through and how many of them died and what a painful and terrible death it was. So it's easy to say that, oh, we eradicated it. Yeah. But to be sure, you still have to vaccinate your kid. And if people don't remember that, if people don't realize how much pain uh, that can cause, we have to make them understand. And Susan and I were involved, actually, when Susan was kind of coordinating that, that, that international effort as well, uh, in uh, subtitling and translating the subtitles to a very, very good documentary that is not, it's not about science, and not about the science of vaccination and, and the rejecting the anti-science-ness of the anti-vaccination movement. It was appealing to our emotions. It was done by the, the Australian skeptics, uh, and it's called The Vaccination Chronicles. It's a half-hour documentary, but it, you, you, you will, if you watch it, you will burst into tears. It's, it's that much pain that comes through. And... Um, and I do recommend you watch it if you haven't yet, and please share it with others. And uh, there are, if if you know someone who speaks a different language from from what we we usually have uh, out there, uh, please get them check out if that uh, their language um, has uh, subtitles for that movie. Because if not, the project is still open. You can do that, and that that is something that you can use to to achieve something. 
another question. Um, yeah, I'm wondering because, as I told you earlier, because I'm working in, in science, uh, and I see, I think, a lot of scientists particularly are not really uh, too interested in, in joining this uh, cause, probably because they have other things to do. I mean, that's probably the main issue. And they take things for granted because, of course, in our ivory tower, these things aren't really an issue. Um, and so I'm wondering, is there a sense of frustration with that uh, in, in, from your point of view? Or is it maybe more like this, it seems like a reasonable division of labor that maybe the scientists do science and then other people actually uh, spread it? I, I work with scientists all the time. We're constantly working with the scientific field. And um, no, I want them to do their science. They have work to do, get your work done. I don't need them to become comedians. I don't need them to become science educators. Balloon animals. Balloon animals, whatever. If they wanted to do more outreach, that would be fantastic. But I'd rather them just do their science. But I work with a lot of them, and we're my project is working to support those people so that they can get their work done and they can they can be better communicators in their own way. But no, I I'm no. What I would like, and one of the things we do with my Wikipedia project is we want their Wikipedia pages not to look like they're coming out of an ivory tower. When we write a Wikipedia page. We want it to be readable and have a little humor and have a little personality. I don't want the person's Wikipedia page to read like they just sprang out of somebody's loin and became a superstar, you know, in an ivory tower somewhere. I'd like to tell a little bit about their story. Why they chose science? Why did they chose this particular type of science? Who inspired them? What were some of their struggles? Maybe they came from a small hometown somewhere here or there. So when a young person who's reading these Wikipedia pages can say, I'm inspired by that, that scientist because I came from that hometown. Let's, uh, there's actually a, a part, a tab on Wikipedia, what was it called, Simple English? Oh yeah, yeah. So Simple English on Wikipedia, it's, it's Simple English, it doesn't simple sound English. like a scientific diatribe, it just cuts to the chase and makes it readable for, you know, kids, so and that, that I think is really important. Bells ring, by the way. Yeah, he mind. does it all the time. <laughs> Every, half hour. Every half an hour for some reason. It works all the time. <laughs> Do we have any more inputs, <laughs> questions, no. disagreements, agreements? Okay. Well, maybe one small question for me. Okay. We have mentioned James Randi, for example, and we have our other figureheads in the community. We have our Richard Dawkinses and our Neil deGrasse Tysons. Is this a good thing or is it a bad thing that we are looking at these charismatic people and there's a lot of personal drama and does that overshadow the things that we should be caring about, the work that needs to be done? Yeah, I, I think that, that those days are going to rapidly draw to a close, otherwise we would have seen the different factions, at least in the United States, come together. Because I remember about 10 years ago, Randy and and Shermer and everyone is going, we're going to all join together. Oh, that was such a lie. I mean, they might have paid some lip service to it, but it's the grassroots. It's the people in this room who can sit at their computer in their pajamas with their cat, like what she does, that are making a difference. These people talk, talk, talk. In fact, Susan and I, one of the reasons we left the bigger organizations is because we got tired of hearing these Stephen... Stephen, uh, you know, uh, Dawkins or, or uh, Tyson or all these people. We just, you know, it was like, talk, 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 do something. You know, it's like, it's time to stop singing and start swinging. And these guys weren't doing it. And they like that. They like their $5,000 fees and all that. So they're not going to change it. But the grassroots groups that we found through going out and actually doing and getting people out in the streets... That's where it's at, and people feel much more, much more empowered. I know that's a new age word, but they feel much more empowered where they can, where they can uh, bond with another human being who's as angry as you are and actually do something. Plus, it's fun sitting and listening to, to Randy talk. I love him dearly. He did the intro to my book, but I just fall asleep because it's it's enough, enough, enough time. I love them all. 
But no, I think that they're not activists, except for Randy. Randy's an activist. But he's 91 years old. No, he isn't. He's 89. 89. He's All doing right. fantastic. I think that I think they're great. I think they're wonderful popularizers of science, but activists, no. I think we, we shouldn't apply a full psychotomy here. So we, it's it's not either or. Uh, we have we have to have spokespeople for for a movement, and spokespeople are usually kind of superstars, uh, and and they. Yeah, of course they, they will enjoy it. That's what we're uh, doing, so we can't really put ourselves in, right? In other yeah. words, we're, we're oh, yeah, Marco said something like that at the beginning. Yep, uh, yeah, I'd like to make that clear. I am personally, I'm not. I'm, I'm not even close to that, and I'm, I'm not sure I even want to. So, but there are superstars in the, the uh, science communication and skeptical movement. That's okay. But we need them to work together with the grassroots. Right. We need them to support each other because there is a face to the movement, there is a face to something, and there is the background work that's being done. And both are very, very important because the public will only see the face, but the result comes from whatever the grassroots movement is doing. Right. Very good. Very good. You said that one. Shall we end on that? <laughs> Any more questions? So maybe for a last small round, what we always should do, I think, try to understand the so-called other side. So maybe you have an anecdote, a personal experience where you had to battle, quote-unquote, someone from the other side, but also learn something from such a person. So maybe for the end, if you could share something like that. I'm in a good situation, I can pass on the microphone because I've already shared a story like that. What did he mind? Uh, my whole book, Psychic Blues, that's what, it, what it's about. I mean, I learned so much, but I didn't, I, when you infiltrate, you can't laugh at somebody and put them down. You have to nod your head and say, I understand, and you have to listen. And I mean, if I learned one thing about mediums and psychics, that's what they do is they listen. And they also pay attention I mean, to me, the psychics of the future are going to be people who pay attention. So that's what I learned, is just listen to people, and suddenly you're like, how did you, there's no way in the world he could know that about me. Yes, there is. You just have to listen. I don't have anything in particular, but uh, if I expand my question just a little bit, so I'll answer quickly. Um, Understanding the other side, if you mean in terms of um, people who aren't into science, are uh, into woo, that type of thing. Okay, so what what usually happens with those kind of people, in my experience, is that it's not like they're hard pressed to to be into that kind of thing. It's just that reason got them there, or emotions got them there in that specific moment that they got there. For example, with parents and vaccination. We have a huge thing about vaccination in Bulgaria that's uh, like a local forum thing. And they're all anti-vax. I mean like the hardcore anti-vax. Uh, and the reason they are is because they really care about uh, their loved ones or whatever we... I mean it's not because they're shitty people. They don't want their kids dead or some shit like that. They just figured out that there's some authority within their in-group that told, me, told them that this is the thing that's happening, that's healthier, or that's more reasonable, etc. And they believe them. So, uh, the only thing I can really uh, drive home is, those people just believe the wrong people. They were just doing the wrong thing at the wrong time. They're, they're not shitty people in themselves. Okay, I've interacted for, I've been involved in the skeptic community for years and years, so I've, I have way too many stories. So what I would probably say instead is I think that as skeptics, when we're interacting with uh, the, the person who is a who still believes in the paranormal, who believes in medical, what we would call woo, we still have to remember that, well, I was there myself, and probably a lot of us were. We started out with that, and nobody yelling at us and making fun of us made us change our minds. And so we need to remember that a person who feels like they've been abducted by aliens 
maybe they're, you know, they're they're not sleeping well at night, and they feel like they're being, you know, abducted or probed or whatever is happening to that poor person. To that person, it is real. They feel that this is happening to them, and understanding the reasons why. Okay, we're all thinking, okay, sleep apnea, or maybe some kind of mix-up with their medications and making them see hallucinations. Or maybe it says, we're all thinking these other things, but we need to remember we got to be kind to that person. They could be, we could have been them too. And they're just missing some information. As Lugo said, they're not dumb. I mean, maybe a couple are, but I mean, they're, they're not dumb. They don't want to believe it. They don't want to be abducted by aliens every night and, and be probed. Well, maybe it's you do. do. Maybe if you do. But uh, my point is we need to be kind. We need to be sympathetic. We need to understand. And we need to understand that to that person it is real. And one more thing, what the question you said about um, how to approach people and how, is it better to, um, to, to give them the information or to let them find the information. I'm going to close on my Wikipedia project. I think, and Randy and I had this conversation a few days ago, is that the important thing is to let people say face. I don't know if it means the same, if you guys get the, the illusion, okay. So, if you tell somebody, you're an idiot, oh my gosh, how stupid, how could you possibly believe that's just water, what an idiot. You're going nowhere. But if you go and you have, um, somebody comes to work or school or whatever and says, you know, you got that cough, it's really been bothering you. Here, let me give you a pill. You try this. And you look at the pill box and you're like, that's just homeopathy. That's homeopathy. And they say, oh, that's natural. And you say, really? I thought it might be something different. You go home, you Google the darn thing, and you're going to come up with some kind of information. Hopefully, it's a Wikipedia page that's been rewritten and, can, and is in great shape. You're going to get that information. You're going to go, you're going to read about it. You're going, this is just a placebo. There's no science to this or whatever. Then you go back the next day and you say, you know, I was looking at this, I did some research, and I'm not really thinking this is so hot for me. Maybe, maybe I'm not so interested in that. And you move on with your life. But what you've just done is you've saved face. You've saved, you've done your own research. Of course, you're not going to say I went to Wikipedia and read it. What you're going to say is, I did my research, I'm not an idiot, I figured it out. And I think that we need to let people say face. Instead of trying to prove a point, and telling them they're stupid, we need to say, you know, I've heard some things about that. Maybe you should look into that. Maybe you should, you know, I, you know, I've heard some, there's some harm in that. And let them find out and let them discover. The only example, the only, ex the only difference I would say is if they're going to harm themselves with something that is harmful, like they're about to do something very dangerous, um, some kind of woo that's very dangerous, then interfere. But anything else that has, you've got some time, let them find out on their own, but guide them along the journey so that they can figure it out. Then they'll become one of the more powerful advocates as well. Uh, did I do the, which is more likely? Yeah, you did. Oh, I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to emphasize that you don't want to be a dick. Don't be a dick. So, um, just a recent experience of mine. Uh, I had a chat with someone who started to talk to me about the idea of uh, you are what you eat, and uh, you know the you know, and you know it has implications as well. Like uh, I don't know if you eat too much sugar, you're gonna be uh, hyperactive or that kind of stuff. And I gave her the look that she realized that I was skeptical about, that, uh, skeptical about the, uh, what she was saying. And she said, you look very skeptical. And then I realized, oh, uh, oh, okay, I need to watch my facial expressions because I could easily end up not, not being taken, care, uh, taken seriously for being a skeptic and being a dick about it. So ask the questions, challenge their views, but do it delicately. That's that's something that we have to do. Thank you so much for being with us in Zurich tonight and thank all of you for joining us and do continue your important work. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for uh,
Marco and Jan for, uh, for uh, having us here and inviting us to um, this event. And uh, yeah, keep up the great work. Hope to see many of you at some point somewhere in Europe. If you're in Hungary, let us know. <laughs> Oh, there's 22 comments. Are you streamed yeah. it live? Can you let me turn the Yeah, streamed it live. So there's 22 comments. Well, we've been getting about 300 views.